Mr. Ardeshi, welcome to Prague. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is uh, Gabor Ardeshi, as you can see, and um, what I'm going to talk about today is actually my hobby. As you can see, I'm a um, molecular biologist by education, but this is absolutely my hobby. This is not my professional work. I mean, uh, I, I do it in my hobby. Uh, you often see strange hobbies. My hobby is reading scientific publications and then analyzing the available information. And um, this um, pile of big pile of information, what I'm ready to throw up on you in, in a minute, um, is the result of something like um, four years of, uh, of reading. So um, what we are going to see today is I will try to prove or show you that uh, what really matters uh, within the interaction of, uh, between food and your physiology is uh, the speed and the location of um, food absorption in, in your digestive system. So uh, these largely determine what happens uh, downstream. And uh, the whole presentation is arranged based on, on this uh, principle. So what is food processing? This is very frequently asked when, when, when I bring this up. And um, I'm told that uh, you cannot really quantify processing because uh, processing is cooking, 400,000 years old process cooking itself. And then we have grinding, that's also tens of thousands of years. Um, how can you quantify that? And I will show you that uh, there are some certain patterns uh, and, and it's really quantifiable in a, in a way at least. And I will give you some kind of a metrics which are of course never measured in uh, modern medicine uh, outside of these uh, research uh, settings. And uh, I will show you that not processing are created equal, not processing techniques and uh, not processing different macronutrients or different foods have, can have uh, vastly different uh, results. Uh, this is just, just the agenda for, for the presentation. Uh, you can read it a little bit later, but uh, I have to do some introduction to the, to the gastrointestinal physiology, how your digestive system works and what hormones are secreted, secreted in response, released in response to different uh, nutrients. And the, the important thing here is that um, we have kind of sensor cells within our, our uh, tube, gut uh, intestinal tube, and uh, these cells release uh, different hormones in response to different nutrients. And uh, interestingly enough, the setup of these cells is uh, the distribution of these cells is not even. So what you see here that some cells are more abundant in the upper part of the small intestines, for example, and other cells are more abundant uh, in the lower part of the small intestines. And actually it has pretty profound uh, implications. You will see later. And unfortunately you have to learn a few abbreviations as well because I will use them uh, extensively during the, the presentation. Uh, the so-called K cells, which is one type of the enteroendocrine uh, cells secreting hormones in response to nutrients, secrete a hormone called GIP. And as you see, the distribution of these cells is uh, much more uh, dense uh, in the upper small intestines, while the L cells, which secrete a bunch of hormones like GIP1, and uh, PYY, GLP2, oxyntomodulin, we will talk about these later a little bit. Uh, these are more, more, much more abundant uh, in the lower parts of the intestines. So what happens when you eat uh, evolutionary appropriate food? Uh, the food goes through the system and triggers the hormonal release from, from these cells. And if you eat something like uh, meat and, and uh, berries and these kind of food foods, uh, they, they have a fairly balanced uh, stimulatory effect on these cells. So you will get uh, all kinds of uh, hormones released in a more or less balanced manner. And I will show you that when you uh, meet 
food items that you are not evolutionarily adapted to, this balance is completely disrupted. Um, just the receptors sensing different nutrients, it's not very important, so I will just uh, skip a little bit. I will only show you one. This SGLT1 is the glucose sensor, sensing glucose, sugar uh, in your small intestine. And uh, both cells contain these receptors and mostly all, all others as well. And uh, again, the distribution is uneven and it has profound uh, implications. Uh, just a few words about the so-called incretin effect. It's very, it's very important. What you see here is a oral glucose load uh, when you eat glucose or uh, intravenous when you get uh, by injection uh, glucose. And the difference is between the insulin response to this glucose, it's called the incretin effect. You see that it's huge, it can be 50-70% of the overall uh, insulin response. So basically what it means that the majority of, uh, ins of the insulin response is stimulated by hormones secreted by these cells and not directly via the via glucose, uh, the sugar itself. And, and uh, yeah, just uh, move on to the, the, the physiologi physiological effects of these uh, hormones. Uh, interestingly, these hormones have a very different effect on top of the insulin stimulating effect. That's almost the only similarity between these two. Uh, I, will, I will just highlight a few. Uh, what you see here, for example, on the pancreas, one, the secreted by the upper part of the, low, uh, the small intestines, stimulates both insulin and glucagon, while the other one stimulates insulin and then it reduces glucagon. This, this is also very important. And then uh, one provides uh, satiety. Your appetite goes down, satiety goes up, food intake goes down. The other one provides some anabolic uh, clues to, for example, adipose tissues. It uh, kind of uh, supports insulin's action on uh, storing uh, lipids and, and, and nutrients. So it's an anabolic type of uh, hormone. It also, if, if, if it's very high, it can create an inflammation in your adipose tissues. These are very important to, to understand, so that's why I'm, I spend the, the time on this. And uh, regarding the, the hunger satiety signaling in, uh, in your uh, digestive system, uh, you have only one hormone that can increase your hunger with its increasing levels, and that's called ghrelin. And all the other hormones decrease your hunger and promote satiety. And you see that uh, three of these hormones, quite interestingly, are secreted by the intestinal L cells. Those cells which are located in the, your lower parts of, of the intestines. Okay, so deep dive into food processing. One of the oldest is cooking. So there are some associational studies looking into this. And um, basically there are some associations between body weight as, as a body mass index and the rate of, of uh, cooking. So the more raw foods one eats, the lower his or her body mass index becomes. This is a general tendency. I'm not saying that this is uh, desirable, for example, because body mass index doesn't tell you a lot about uh, how much muscle you have or uh, kind of uh, these kind of things. But there is an overall tendency that uh, with uh, increasing processing or uh, more and more cooking, your body mass index tends to be higher. Uh, specif specifically looking at uh, carbohydrate rich foods and cooking them, uh, provides you with a lot of extra nutrients or energy, if you wish. Sometimes you can get two or three times more energy out of uh, cooking, uh, for example, potatoes. Eating a raw potato uh, will result in a certain amount of uh, digestible starch. But if you cook it, it can be double or triple the digestible starch. Going on, it's uh, not to the same extent, but it's the same for uh, cooking lipid and uh, protein-rich foods. 
if you cook, for example, um, uh, peanuts high in lipids, uh, cooking consistently increases the energy gain. And then uh, much, a lot more uh, amino acids make it to your large intestines, to your large bowels, if, if you don't cook an egg, for example. If, if, you, if you eat a cooked egg, it's much lower. This is an interesting study. Mice fed with meat, or I think it's uh, some kind of a potato, it's, they say tuber. So what happens with the weight of uh, mice when you try different processing techniques on, on the meat? This is raw, whole, raw, pounded, me mechanical processing, cooked whole, cooked, pounded, and the same for, for the tuber. Actually, these mice lose weight, and they eat meat. What, in whatever form, there is a difference between the, the whole and the raw, but uh, not a huge one. And uh, they don't lose weight when you cook your tuber. Uh, going on to processing uh, protein, for example, you can hydrolyze, pre-digest pre your protein. And what you, what you experience is that there is a mild elevation, but statistically significant elevation in the, in the metabolic hormones, uh, insulin and glucagon. Uh, especially insulin, so it changes a little bit the insulin to glucagon ratio if you pre-hydrolyze, pre-digest your, your uh, protein. This, this effect is not good. But when we come to carbohydrate processing, and uh, this is ap apples, when you eat a whole apple or you puree your apple or when you juice your apple and drink, drink, drink the same amount of uh, carbohydrate, so, so you use the whole apple, it's just, the, just the, the, the only difference is what you do with it. Eat it, or blend it, or juice it. So you see that uh, the glycemic, glycemic index is not very useful, very similar to glucose responses. But what happens is that uh, after pureeing, and especially juicing, you have a postprandial, meaning after the meal, it says 90 minutes, one and a half hours, you see a very significant drop in uh, blood glucose compared to the baseline. This is uh, typical for uh, ultra-processed uh, carbohydrates. Very quick absorption and uh, very high insulin stimulated and uh, blood glucose goes below the baseline. You will see several of these later. So this is the insulin response typically to the three. Slow and fast, uh, don't let you bother you. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, they try to control for the speed because normally you can just drink uh, apple juice in a few seconds and you have to eat the apples uh, for a much longer time, but they try to control for this by drinking the juice slowly. Doesn't matter. Again, grinding grains, another type of uh, processing. Uh, this is wheat, and what you see, this is the insulin response. What you see is a gradual increase by grinding it finer and finer. The finer it is ground, your insulin response, this is uh, again, same amount of uh, available carbohydrates. It's just a, a way of processing what is different. It's a gradual increase in, in the insulin responses. This is the area under curves you, you see here. Grinding rice. Again, brown rice, white rice. If you eat it whole, not a big difference. It, if you eat them uh, ground, ground up, refined, there is a big difference between the two, but not with, between the white and brown rice. Interestingly, and this is again glucose responses. No difference. So what you see from the glycemic index and glycemic load is nothing. No difference. But what you see from the insulin responses, that's quite a big difference. Same amount of nutrients, same type of nutrients. This is a very interesting study, one of my favorites. And um, what you see here, the Finnish guys, 2002 you see the same blood glucose dropping below baseline with the fine wheat bread. All the others are doing okay. You see again, there is a small difference between glucose responses. And they say that what, what the difference is, is not the amount of fiber, because they try to add back fiber to this. It's not the amount of fiber, but it's the change of structure, actually. So you can add back fiber, it won't help you much. But if you disrupt the structure, then uh, it has very adverse, uh, adverse metabolic effects. And you see it on the next slide. 
huge differences in insulin and GIP, GIP again is the, the hormone released in the upper part because it is absorbed very uh, quickly. It, it, it doesn't trigger the, the lower part of the small intestine, only the upper part. Uh, same group, one year later, they show very similar things with the different breads. It's uh, high fiber rye, traditional rye, endosperm rye, refined wheat. And what I did, uh, actually, they provided here the, the uh, area under the curve, so the overall amount of these hormones, GIP and GIP1, upper, lower hormones, and I calculated the ratio, how it changes the ratio. Again, same amount of nutrients and same types of nutrients. And what it does, you have a ratio of 2.75 with the traditional rye bread, and then if with the refined wheat bread, you have a ratio over 5. So it dramatically changes how these two hormones are released, the upper part hormones and the, and the lower part hormones. And uh, one, of the, one of the highest correlations I have ever seen between uh, in vitro, which means uh, lab petri dish data, and in vivo live uh, measurements. These are measured uh, glu blood glucose and blood insulin data fitted to uh, lab uh, starch digestion. So you take an enzyme which breaks down uh, starch, you measure in 30 minutes or 50 minutes or whatever time how much is converted to glucose, and then you try to uh, correlate it to your physiological responses. Look at this. The maximum you can get here is 1. It's 0 0.95. And the statistical significance is also uh, very high. So just by measuring how, how quickly the, some kind of starch digests in a petri dish, you can predict what happens in your complex system. Uh, let's move on to mixed meals, so uh, isolated nutrients. We are more interested in mixed meals. Nobody eats uh, just starch alone or just butter alone. You usually mix it up into a meal or sandwich, typically. What you see, uh, where it's, uh, this is the, the glucose is not relevant because it's, it is done in a controlled uh, hyperglycemic uh, environment. So it's, uh, they, they clamped it's this level to be stable. What you see, that uh, if you add more food, you get higher insulin responses. That's, that's normal. So you add uh, bread and butter on, on top of the meat, and it's okay. But what you see is the two hormones, the two gut hormones, when you eat a sandwich and when you eat these components alone, are not really proportional. The so-called good lower intestinal hormone is almost the same, while the upper intestinal hormone, the GIP, just skyrockets. When you, when you add fat and, and, and the carbohydrate uh, together in a, in a meal. Uh, this is a very interesting study. Actually, it's mostly plant-based. So uh, at the end of the presentation, you, you won't blame me that uh, I, I only uh, promote uh, meat eating. Uh, you can see the same effects uh, within a heavily plant-based uh, diet. So these two diets, the reference and the PAL2, are same calories. Very similar macronutrient distributions, fat, protein, and, and carbohydrates. The only difference is the, the type of processing. There are white, uh, there is white rice and mango and cooked carrots in the Western type plant-based diet. And uh, there is some extra, uh, there, there are some extra fruits and vegetables in, in the other one. You can see the, the difference between the weight. Same calories, similar macronutrient distribution, but there is a almost three, threefold difference in, in the weight. So that kind of uh, si signals the, the, uh, the processing. And what you see is, again, a huge imbalance between the two types of uh, hormones coming from the upper and the lower intestine. It's basically just uh, switches. When, uh, for one, uh, the good one is much higher, and uh, the, the, the bad one is not. It doesn't really, really work like that, but uh, let me just say that good and bad. It's easier to understand. Um, and then it, it switches around when you, when you examine the, the other one. It's, it's completely the opposite. Uh, this is a mice study, really interesting. I, I believe this is a typical mice feeding uh, setup. When, when uh, mice are given a so-called high-fat diet, which is sugar and, and lard, they become much more obese than, than uh, mice fed with a regular chow. 
And um, is it due to the fat? Do, do we know it for, for certain? Well, actually, if you fine grind powder, the, the control chow, this one, you just fine grind it, that feed the same thing to the, to the mice. All difference is gone. But you see that the level of refining, when the level of refining is matched, is the same. All difference is gone. There is no difference between the ob obesity rate. These, these uh, mice start eating like crazy this, this uh, powdered stuff. There is something changing in their, in their satiety, hunger signaling. Let's try to find out what. OK, just uh, one more um, uh, related topic. So how often and, and how big size of food you should eat. Uh, I'm, I'm not really popular among uh, dietitians because I usually say the opposite of what they do. And uh, I base it on these uh, scientific papers, what I read. And uh, it, it, it's basically, you are much better off if you eat fewer and larger meals compared to eating frequent and small meals. Why? Exactly because of uh, the, the effect of these hormones. And what you see is uh, uh, after a low caloric meal, the ins insulin response is, is disproportionately high. So it's not proportional to the meal size, but the lower you go, uh, the proportionately the higher the insulin response. Also, the same for, for diabetics. It's better if you feed them a large meal. And uh, if you want to develop uh, fatty liver by overfeeding yourself, then you have to do via eating a lot of small meals. Because if you eat large meals, you leave, you, you leave a, a lot of time between meals, then your liver can get rid of the, the fat, actually. So you will get, of course, you will, you will be more obese, but you don't develop all the met metabolic uh, disturbances. Uh, a little bit more, it's basically the same, so I will just skip it. This is insulin resistance, as you can see it, uh, obese and, and uh, healthy, uh, abdominally obese people and healthy people, uh, impaired lipid uptake to their adipose tissues with, uh, already with three meals a day. Eating speed, you may be surprised, but eating slowly is good for you. Maybe the only thing I agree with most uh, dietitians that uh, it's scientifically proven that if you eat more slowly, the good hormones, the satiety hormones, are released in a, in a more pronounced uh, manner. So with more of these hormones, you can see. And uh, yeah, it has, it has some inherited. Even, it works even with ice cream. Eating ice cream more slowly is, is better for you. Now, I won't say it's good for you, but it's, it's a little bit better. Okay, some proxies. We already discussed glycemic index blood glucose response. Um, uh, it's not really good metrics, I believe. But what about glycemic load? This is, a this is from a book uh, about uh, industrial sweeteners, like sugars and, and other sweeteners. And uh, this shows the development of the estimated development of glycemic load over our past uh, 12,000 years of history. A marks agricultural revolution. You have a steady increase, and B marks the industrial evolution. Look at that, it's almost vertical. Your glycemic load, it's a, I, I say it's a proxy for food processing, or ultra processing, skyrockets with the industrial revolution. And how about this one? It's, it's another proxy, fiber in food. Uh, the, the full, uh, Circles here represent your, um, uh, our average carbohydrate intake within the last century. So it's 20th century. It started out high, early 20th century, and we ended up high again, late 20th century. There was a dip in between. So we consume approximately the same amount of carbohydrates now. What is different? The difference is in the fiber content of this food, which I say it's a proxy for processing. And what happened here? I think this is a natural um, increase with increasing industrial foods. So more milled, more finely uh, ground uh, grains. So it's a slow increase. But what happened here? And that's around the mid-80s. 
the mid 80s some of the U united states uh, authorities issued recommendations to the food industry to increase the at the time it was 2000 uh, 2500 items uh, reduced in fat to increase it, it quickly to 5,000, at least 5,000 items. I don't think that there is a causal relationship. It's causative, but there is a, at least an interviewing association between the two. Okay, so these papers just uh, reconcile that it, it's uh, not about carbohydrates overall, uh, and it's, it's about the, the, the processing so that the speed of absorption the disruption of plant structure, what, what really matters. You will have access to the presentation, so all these nice quotes uh, you can read uh, later. This was actually measured and supported in, in uh, obese uh, people versus healthy people. And what you see is exactly, if you remember, these LGLT1 uh, sensors, glucose sensors, which are kind of upregulated in, in the obese. So this has very profound um, implications again. Uh, hunger signaling, the hunger hormone we, we, we talked about a little bit uh, before, it's called ghrelin, different macro, macronutrients, but these are purified ingredients. So when, when we say carbohydrates, don't think of uh, beans or, or these kind of things. This is purified ingredients, carbohydrates 80% and protein 80% and, and uh, fats 80%. And what you see is that eating carbohydrates pushes down uh, ghrelin, which is a good thing. The lower it is, the less hungry you are. And then it quickly uh, bumps back, quickly goes above baseline. And this is, this quick increase is a clear hunger signal. And again, interestingly enough, it coincides within the same study with the pushing down the, the blood glucose level below baseline. It's exactly the same timing, around uh, four hours. Look at this. So when your blood glucose is going down after a quick refined carbohydrate meal, I saw a lot of you ate uh, croissants, for example, expect this, you are going to be hungry after three, four hours again. This is basic physiology. There is nothing magic about it. If you eat it alone, if you eat it with protein and fat, you will see it's, it's different. So this is a comparison between uh, obese and, and the normal weight uh, people. And what you see, Normal weight people have normal signaling. They see the, the satiety signaling, and, and it's, you can measure the hormones, actually. So you see the hormones, satiety hormones going up, going up, going up, hunger hormone going down, going down, it's minus, minus, minus. What happens in the, in the obese? They have a screwed signaling. They don't see the satiety signal, and uh, they, they have a very s small suppression in hunger, and especially with uh, refined carbohydrate-rich meals. If it's protein and fat, it's, much, it's largely preserved, this normal signaling, but it's lost when it's a high-carbohydrate meal. So you shouldn't feed a lot of carbohydrates, especially refined carbohydrates, to obese people. They don't see the, the satiety signaling. It's basic physiology again. You see the differences here. These are the satiety and hunger hormones. Um, this is measured again in Chinese people. Same thing. High protein or high fat meal induces more favorable postprandial satiety and appetite hormonal responses than a high carbohydrate meal. And uh, another interesting one, it's not about carbohydrates and, uh, and fats and proteins, but it's about uh, when you eat the carbohydrate with your meal. If you eat a sandwich as a whole, or if you eat the, the carbohydrate part, the starch, before your meal or after your meal. Actually, it turns out that the thousands of years uh, wisdom of eating carbs last, so as a dessert, works. Look at the difference between the hunger hormone. At three hours, if you eat the carbohydrates last, there's a huge difference between if you had the carbohydrates first. Uh, this is a very recent study, uh, or drinking huge amounts of orange juice, adding, adding to the diet of, of people. Orange juice full of sugar. You would say it's inherently bad. I'm not saying it's good, but there is a big difference when you drink the, the orange juice. Actually, if you drink the orange juice together with your meal, again, not snacking, together with your meal, there are some favorable changes compared to their 
uh, actual physiological state. If you eat it, you drink it between meals as a snack, you gain weight and your insulin sensitivity tends to go down. I mean, uh, calories, of course, the amount of food was not properly controlled. It cannot be in this uh, setup. But uh, this gives you a sense of uh, what happens when, when uh, you keep eating all day long and, and very frequently. Uh, this is a uh, very technical, a little bit minor importance, but uh, there is a positive feedback between insulin and this GIP. So the more of this stuff you eat, the more you will require and the more, the higher and higher and higher, it's kind of a self-generating uh, thing, uh, the worse it, it becomes. And that's what you see in, in obese. And uh, just a few words about this. These are two kinds of sugars. Uh, exactly the same chemical um, structure. Sucrose is table sugar. Isomaltulose is another sugar consisting of the same glucose and fructose molecules just attached at a different uh, place. What happens is, there's a big difference in the balance of the hormones we, we discussed. So this isomaltulose is uh, absorbed slowly and the sucrose, sugar, is absorbed quickly. What you see, just the opposite. And when, it, when you translate it to a mouse study, what happens is this one, uh, but the basics are same in the, in, the, in the mice. This one, glucose is the same, insulin is the same, no difference. Actually, the sucrose is a little bit lower. Insulin is, you don't see the difference, but where the difference is, is in this GIP. It's huge. There is a huge difference. And guess which mice develop fatty liver? You can tell from here, but not from here. Um, the effect of combining uh, refined car carbohydrates with fat. You see here, huge response in GIP. So I would say you either don't butter your potato or you don't potato your butter. Whichever camp you are in, it's probably not a, a very good idea. But actually, if you think of it, if you have an evolutionary uh, way of thinking, uh, which foods are high, which natural foods are high in both easily accessible carbohydrates and fats? Name me, name me one. Thank you. That's, that's also the one I know. There is no, there is none. So we see again, this is a huge GIP response. Okay, this one you can check. It's a very recent uh, review of this. Uh, I'm not alone with this view. It seems that some, some other researchers, or some researchers, I'm not a researcher for me, um, come to the same conclusion. It's in, uh, it was recently published in the Trends in Endocrinology and Metabolism. It's a very nice uh, journal. And uh, you wonder how many papers are published on the, the, the adverse, ad adverse effects of this uh, hormonal imbalance, imbalance in the gut. So where it says GIP is bad and then and GIP1 is good. Actually, plenty. So I will provide a reference list for you. So the, the literature is full of this. So some more supporting information. How bariatric surgery works. Everybody says, it reduces your stomach, to, to, it's, it's a small stomach afterwards, and, uh, and uh, also you have some malabsorption and so on and so forth. Uh, not really. If you have a closer look, there is, there is something missing. And what is missing is actually that within a week, you have a profound change in, in the, the balance of these hormones. You see the good goes up, bad goes down, just a different, I, I like to say that it creates an opposite imbalance uh, within a week. But some people say that within a week you can lose so much weight that this is also attributable, this, this is about, this is due to the weight loss. Okay, I have another paper, of course. This is three days, not a week, three days. And after three days, you see changes. So, it, but these were not diabetic, non-diabetic, so it's, uh, it's, uh, the changes are smaller. But it, it's in three days, if you, if you go on a water, water fast, you don't eat for three days. You don't have these results. So it's, it's obviously not from the weight loss. It's from the metabolic rearrangement of your gut. Many more, there are some procedures uh, inserting a sausage peel into your small intestine. So bypassing the upper part. Whatever nutrients comes in, this bypasses because it's a sausage peel in the inside. And the effect, exactly the same. We are talking about the same hormones. 
In fact, it's the same. You can use a drug or a alpha glucositase inhibitor. It inhibits the enzyme that breaks down starch. And you will see the same, same hormones, same changes, same benefits. What's more, what, what's more, uh, a couple of years ago, there was this study published. Um, basically, you can do it with a pill. You can do a gastric surgery effects with a pill. This is the, these are the benefits of the, the gastric uh, surgery. And this is what you get from this uh, simple inhibit, inhibitor of the, the, uh, of the, uh, the SGLT1, the receptor for, for glucose, the, tra the, the transporter, the sensor. If you block the sensor, you get the same benefit. And the same side effects, of course. Um, yeah, this is a meta-analysis of 97 studies, different diabetes drugs. What you see, one drug, curiously, has no benefit. This is called DPP4 inhibitor, which inhibits the enzyme that breaks down both, uh, that uh, stops breaking down both hormones. So you don't change the balance. And the long-term benefit on all-cause on all mortality is actually zero. All the other drugs, drugs work. They have different, uh, this increases their good hormone. And this is just uh, lets you urinate glucose. What a fantastic idea instead of not eating it. And uh, what you see, the, these work also against a, um, the control and for the other, against the other drug. This, this DPP-4 inhibitor doesn't seem to work. But it's sold and you are prescribed. For me, it's a little bit strange. OK, how do low-carbohydrate diets work? They remove all the carbohydrates. So inherently, they remove bad carbohydrates too, if there, are such, if there is such thing as, bad, as a bad carbohydrate. But as you saw, as you just saw, yes, some carbohydrates are worse, and it, and it solely depends on the processing. If you ultra-refine it, then the carbohydrate is not beneficial. And you can, you can see this is three meals of a low-carbohydrate diet. Three meals, one the day before and two during the measurement days. After three meals, adding exercise is the X. Exercise doesn't matter at all. No, no effect, low short-term effect, sorry. The exercise is good for you, but short-term metabolic effect you don't see here. But low carb and high carb, you immediately see after three meals, less, less, less than a day or a day. And what's the, what's the trick? It's a vastly decreased GIP secretion after the three meals after the low carbohydrate test. Okay, time for wrap up. Scientific conclusions may be a little bit difficult to, to grab. Uh, the speed and location of absorption is critical. And that's what we change with food processing. And if you remember the graph, how much more food, processed foods we eat, that's dramatic change over the last couple of uh, decades. And uh, the greatest effect is seen with carbohydrate-rich plant processing, because carbohydrate can, can be broken down very quickly. And uh, if it's broken down, then uh, the satiety signaling is simply missing. So you, don't, you are not satisfied with your refined carbohydrates. After three hours, we discuss it, you eat again and you eat again. Um, we, we discussed uh, several times the, 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 the imbalance it causes in the, the gut hormones. And you can explain almost everything based on this imbalance. That's a nice thing. You, you, you cannot explain everything with uh, increased insulin. But how insulin is increased by these hormones? You can explain almost everything. Um, and when you add fat on top of these diets, I call it the donut effect. So if you like donuts, go ahead, refine carbohydrates, add the fat on top. This effect is greatly exaggerated. So that's the most fattening thing you can imagine based on this, this data. And uh, the GIP, I told you a little bit about um, uh, how it's, uh, it's uh, self-accelerating when, when uh, it, it is combined with high insulin. It's kind of a thrifty machinery. Maybe it's part of our evolutionary adaptation when we, when we find um, quickly digesting energy-rich uh, foods in the nature, then we can gain a little bit weight for the winter. So I think this, is the, this may be the actual mechanism um, underlying this thrifty phenotype. And uh, the practical conclusions, probably this is the, the most interesting part for you. Um, that's uh, processing of food items high in uh, protein and fat is mostly uh, not harmful. So you can cook your meat, continue to cook your meat, it's not a problem. And um, 
prioritize food because uh, of the hunger satiety signaling, rich in um, protein and fat. That's my recommendation. Be careful with plant foods, especially if they are processed. It's difficult to predict. You saw so many, so many different curves. It's very difficult to predict what and how it will uh, influence your metabolism. And um, you, you should consume carbohydrate-rich foods at the end of the meal as a dessert. If you, if you decide to eat it, eat it like a dessert, as a dessert. And have fewer larger meals instead of frequent small meals. Stacking is a very bad idea, and it's a very recent addition. The word, word itself is a very recent addition to our vocabulary. Eat your meals slowly if you can. That's another final advice from me. And thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, you can find this information later. I will share all the references um, for, for the studies used here. Thank you very much. Thank you.